questions. And I want to start with uh, Her Excellency. Uh, Nora, there is a report that everybody will have just received uh, entitled Towards a Future of AI-Driven Creativity in the UAE. Everybody, uh, I hope you all have one of these. Nora, with the greatest of respect, what is the Minister of Culture doing here talking about AI-driven creativity? Explain. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My question to you, Becky, is why isn't every minister talking about AI? Touche. <laughs> well done. I thought you were going to say, what are you doing here? <laughs> no, thanks to Google Maps. And I just have to thank Google, uh, Google Maps. And I'm ever yeah. adapted to Google Maps in terms yeah. of not getting lost. But I feel that um, we, are the, we are the ministry. I mean, we are the cabinet of the future. Uh, and I feel it's always mostly important is to be ahead of the game, to invent the way forward, and look at the roadmap. And we understand and technology and digitization and, and also enhancing the experience of cultural, the cultural experience and also training in, in that sense has been an essence in terms of even my colleagues are the experts and they're in the field. Uh, I don't want to dwell on, on the amazing stuff they, they work on, but for us as a government uh, and, and as a leader in the sector, how can we enable that? How can we facilitate that? And how can we look at what is the way forward? Having uh, a colleague, a minister of artificial intelligence is something I'm lucky, we're lucky to have uh, uh, in our government, how we intersect, and how is the cultural sector and AI, and there's that diffusion that we need to be looking into when it comes to culture and technology at the same time. Sarah, we are talking then about innovation I think, and accessibility, ensuring that this discussion does not glean over the fact that so much of the great discussion we've had about AI here uh, in the past uh, 24 hours or so has ensured that we all consider we are leaving nobody behind as we look to an AI driven future. So let's just have that discussion now. I know Nora and I have had this a number of times in the past. How do we ensure inclusivity going forward in the creative industries for the consumption of culture going forward without leaving people behind? Sure. If we look at um, the stages of cultural production, mm. uh, and I'm indebted here to uh, an economist in Italy, um, uh, Mr. Sacco, Professor Sacco, and he talks about culture 1.0 is one of patronage. It's where um, huge resources are uh, invested into um, a small number of outcomes for an elite audience. Mm. Culture 2.0 is that which, uh, it's a broadcast technology. It's a 21st century, uh, 20th mm. century model. It's cinema. <laughs> and then it, with culture 3.0, we've got this... Um, this networked based and the breaking down of both producer and consumer. So this is where AI comes in because in a networked world, um, these uh, technologies which enable socialization and enable the reconfiguring of that production model, that's what we're talking about. And that's inclusivity. I mean, I'll give you a minute and a half, uh, quite frankly, to give us your, your uh, play on what Google is doing in this space. But before we talk about where governments and private sector can work together for the accessibility and innovation of the creative industries going forward. Sure. So, you know, for us, I think at Google, uh, a few years ago, we realized that uh, there is an opportunity to create a level playing field when it comes to the dissemination of high culture. Mm. And I speak specifically about high culture in terms of operas, ballets, fine art, you know, uh, you know, areas that I didn't think personally were for me. Uh, and, you know, we realize that technology really creates a level playing field where, you know, there is no, uh, uh, you know, difference between a museum from, let's say, you know, uh, India mm. versus a museum from New York that might have a very large population coming to it as long as we can create an experience for people online that equates them. And so the whole idea for us was to create something called the Cultural Institute and have a product called Google Arts, which gives you access to around 1,500 museums from around the world. But what it does more than access, we started with access, but we quickly realized access without context is useless. 
So if I just create a database of artworks, it's not going to serve any purpose. So it needs to have storytelling. It needs mm. to have curation. And then I think the biggest problem, we realized you can have access, you can have context, but if there's no fun, if there's no mm. utility, then why would people who have not interacted with art come to it? And so that's really what we have been playing with is these four different words are on access, context, utility, and fun. Now, when you took this position, when you were asked to take this position, what was your sense of where the cultural sector was in the UAE and where you wanted to take it? And as you have, what, done, what, three, four months now in this, in this role, three, thank you. <laughs> I know those are long, those are long days. Um, how has your perception changed, if at all? I, I think, um, you know, recently we've been witnessing wonderful projects uh, and even individuals and uh, foundations that contribute and what we call our ammunitions and operators in the cultural sector. And there are individuals as well. Mm. Uh, yet the UAE has a history. There are historical sites, archaeological sites uh, from uh, back to, you know, 600,000 years ago to, 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 to this date. And, and all of that, and then you're having that conversion of what we can see and what Amit is saying is, what is the element of fun, but most importantly, what is the element of context? And what is the element of the strength of how people, uh, people look into culture, look into arts, look into music, look into all of the beautiful um, multi-genres that we are working on here in the UAE? It's, it's a multi-diverse country. Uh, we have uh, amazing UAE talents. Uh, we have also great residents who are also part of the scene. That makes it a richer scene, okay? Yet, we also want to focus on how can we look at the cultural scene in the UAE as a, the UAE creative and cultural industry. Mm. This is an industry. Now, when I say an industry, I'm not saying that we're adding, you know, it has to be the value of money. It's not that. It's why does it make sense? Why uh, is it important to look at it in a more of a cohesive way? Uh, we need to have a cultural map, a UAE cultural map. How are we doing great in certain areas and how are we do working less in certain areas? Mm. Yet most importantly, how it will be embedded in education, in the education and curriculum with the Ministry of Education? How will it be also part of the culture of each organization from ministries, private sector, hospitals, homes? For kids to go and visit the Louvre Abu Dhabi and uh, enjoy, the, uh, the, enjoy the museum of the children over there, in 10 years, I know that they will appreciate what they see. Mm. Currently, people will go there and they will appre still appreciate, but the ratios of understanding and appreciation, how the cultures and how the art is, is different. Mm. So for us, we want to package all that. We want to design it in a way mm -hmm. to make us be able to measure it, look how uh, impactful it is for the youth, for the generations, for our visitors, for our residents, for our Emiratis, and most importantly also how to look at it as a creative industry that will support the future, the non-oil mm. sector future of the UAE. So Sarah, how does an AI-driven future play a role in that vision? So one of my responsibilities, I think, is uh, both the creation of data, but also its transition in time mm. and space. And uh, abundant big cultural data is big cultural capital. Uh, and we are, with AI technology, we have this ability to uh, mine into uh, deep time and deep space. Mm. And it's the long tail of cultural material that we create that we now have access to, and that's the important connection with the past. Um, in my university recently, we, we digitized 11,000 hours of the Montreux Jazz Festival <laughs> archives. Great. Um, that's a big data set. Um, but one interesting thing, uh, together with a US company, is we took um, Miles Davis's uh, song Tutu mm. and Smoke Over the Water by Deep Purple, mm. and these were encoded into DNA, DNA sequences. And then uh, they were de-encoded, and you can listen to them in our museum. This uh, is a stable medium for 5,000 years, so it's a radical shift in how we think about mm. the transition of 
uh, cultural knowledge through time and space. And you've given us a great example of how an AI-driven future isn't just about data mining. It's how data mining, and I think, I mean, I know you've got some good examples of this as well, isn't just about that. It feels like when you're talking about data, culture, and arts, that they're sort of anathema to each other. But the idea being here, I think, is that you, that you mine this data by machine to allow your creators, your curators, the time to get creative <laughs> um, with what they do with their data, correct? Is, am, am, I, am I going along the right lines here? I just need to keep quiet and <laughs> let you speak. Go on. <laughs> no, but on, honestly, that, I completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the role for AI, you know, AI is the word. Last year we spoke about VR. Mm -hmm. Next year we might speak about something else, you know. There, there's a lot of noise. And what happens when there's a lot of noise is cultural organizations that have limited resources and funding uh, are kind of struggling to figure out where to focus their efforts on. And I think one of the things that we've learned is that rather than making all the museums engineers, it might be easier to get the museums and the cultural authorities to work with engineers. Mm. Because I think it's not going to be easy for every uh, institution, whether it's government funded or private, to really have a complete IT department or a digital department. Mm. So I think this collaboration is critical for mining the data, but also for experimenting. Because we are at the very, very early stages of what AI can do. And I think at this stage, it's really about experimenting, bringing in the artist, bring mm. the curator, bring the data, and then see what happens. Mm. Uh, you, you've just given us, Sarah, some, a, a couple of really good examples of the value added of an AI-driven future. I mean, can, you, can you do the same, if you will? The value? Mm. Well, I think, you know, well, that, I think there's, there, there's a lot to say here, so I'll try and keep it, I'll try and keep it with one or two mm. examples. I think uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, in my limited time of working in the cultural field, I'm not a cultural person, I have no PhD in arts, mm -hmm. I'm actually the least educated person on this panel <laughs> when it comes to art. Uh, but one thing I realized is that cultural sectors, unfortunately in different countries, have been siloed into verticals. You have visual arts, you have archaeology, you have music, you have, they're all segments. But what AI and what we have started seeing is when you start mixing data from these cross-disciplinary initiatives. So for example, if you take fine art and then you connect it to archeological digs that have taken place in certain parts of the world, mm. you find amazing uh, connections that are not possible from the human mind at the moment because you're passing through heavy amount of data. So I think that's one amazing feature mm. where maybe these uh, different disciplines could talk to each other a bit more. Mm. Uh, and the second one I think for me is, uh, you know, allow people who are, who are, let's say, ambivalent to art to feel that it's not elite. Mm. to feel that they can have fun with it. Mm. And there are some examples over there we've just done where you allow a person without any knowledge of an artwork mm. to just come take a photo of themselves and be matched to a portrait from any museum around the world mm. in an instant second mm. with the hope that they then go deeper. So Nora, give, give us a sense through, through the report that we've just received um, about what the UAE's roadmap is for the future of culture and your, your in, uh, assurance, if you will, that, that the, the dangers that people sort of feel are inherent in an AI-driven future, not least that nobody will leave the house going forward, <laughs> that they'll all sort of do everything from home on a sort of, you know, on a headset, that, 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 that the roadmap has, 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 has built in sort of speed humps, as it were. Well, um, I think, with, with, uh, with the UAE and what we've worked on as well, as you mentioned in the beginning of our mm. panel is, I mean, this is just a paper to show how um, an AI-driven creativity can you know, help the, mm. you know, the, the cultural scene and the economy at the same time. And I hope it's a paper not just for the UAE government, but also governments around the world to look at how we're, you know, there, there is always a start point. How can we invent this you know, starting point of how can we look into uh, the division between AI and the cultural sectors. And as my uh, panelists speaking is like, you know, we look at the sectors, each one is different one, and we look at the data and how it should be smarter. I have a question. Have we ever thought of how much is an average time for an individual 
to look at one painting in a museum or an art piece or a, or a necklace or whatever it is. And from that data helps us also to create a better experience in the future. We're looking at how can we get, get it smarter, mm. uh, utilize this data, how we can adapt such data to help us with such experience mm. and the way forward. And I believe that, you know, we all, we all said, okay, we stopped watching TV because we watch YouTube. We stopped. Yet, yet again, it's, you know, there will be always this question of people mentioning the risks of technologies. Yet again, the, the most important thing is that we learned it and we, that we have to adopt that we have to look at how can we implement it in a way that will support the cultural industry by itself and enhance, mm. as we mentioned, the experience, whether it's in music, whether it's in a painting, or an old archaeological site in the UAE uh, to give context into things. I know that I'm dragging the average age of this panel up somewhat. And if I worked in your department, I know that I would be really dragging the average age up. And there's a point to this. How important is it that you have a very young ministry you are surrounded by millennials yeah. as are so many of the industries and sectors here and how big a role are they playing in devising this vision going forward how important is that the important element is how can we get the youth to talk to pioneers Mm. to talk to individuals who have been in the field from the beginning, who have been individuals who were there as even an artist mm. or a curator or an author or a musician. We do have individuals who started in such fields without any support of the government. Mm. Yet again, we have also the youth that looks into the future. The most important thing, Becky, is I know we always talk about youth and the importance of youth and how are they driving the future, yet it's really important to look at also what we already have here in the country. Mm. We live between a you know, generation that witnessed this country before the inception of the UAE. My parents were around before 1971. My father is an ex-military guy who never owned a laptop, but he's wonderful on an iPhone, and he's telling <laughs> me what are the, 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 mm. the latest apps. So, Let's look at it as all of us as citizens, you know, we are adaptive, we look at technologies and we look at also how the youth will be part of it. Mm. Yet understanding um, how this will be driven, it's definitely a collaborative work. Mm. Yes, we, I mean, the average age is, is mostly uh, young people who are working in the ministry and mm. also at, the, at, at our cabinet of the future, yet mostly the most important is that culture is not limited with age mm. or gender. Or, or let's say background. It should be, it should be open. It should be, it should be where it should be rich, and and I think it's just how how we reach there is how we can get everyone to to align in terms of that roadmap. And, and this is a conversation about not being frightened of experimentation, right? Yeah. As you suggested. I mean, you know, it, do, do we think that there is a there is a younger generation who is simply not frightened of experimentation that is helping drive? this sort of vision? So whenever I think about uh, the future, mm. I also like to look into the past and mm. what happened in the past. And uh, if you look uh, into the past, uh, the, the period that we're experiencing now is often described as a renaissance. And in fact, the first renaissance happened in the Arab Islamic world um, a thousand mm. years ago. It was 500 years before Europe. And this is a moment of great ferment where cultural forces and scientific innovation mm. are melded together. And it's the ability of culture to shape technology that's most interesting and that creates this abundant new, uh, this shift in society from a antiquity to modernity, if you like, and from modernity to what comes next. Mm. And if we think about um, uh, great polymaths from the 19th century, like Al Jazari, and he created these wonderful machines, the first intelligent machines in the world, mm. uh, uh, the water uh, orchestra or the elephant clock. These were machines that were imbued with... Um, uh, life-giving forces mm. like uh, programmability, universalism, mm. permanent power supply, perpetual motion. These are all qualities that we talk about today mm. as artificial intelligence. So drawing this long bow, I think, is really, really important mm. to, to considering what that future is um, and how it gets shaped. 
I'm getting told to, to, to wind this up just very briefly, 30 seconds. What are the new initiatives that we should watch out for? I know you've got, you've got things up your sleeve. Doppelganger, for example, when do we get to do that? Well, it's launched in five <laughs> countries. Uh, we, uh, we just found out that 60 million people have taken selfies trying to find their art doppelganger. So that's 60 million people who probably wouldn't have gone to a museum to see a portrait. So that's great news. So it's coming soon to the region, uh, but not, it's not ready. She agrees. I agree, I agree. She agrees. When it is, Nora will have it, I'm sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Go on, Nora, final word. Very, very important mm. is that um, we were working on, uh, we, we launched it recently by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, is that the UAE will be the first in the MENA region to have a, a creative industry contribu contribution index. Yes. Uh, and by that, it's that we don't. We, we really want to measure uh, what we're having. We really want to measure uh, uh, culture and the impact of culture. Uh, it's beautiful. It's uh, some people like to call it, unfortunately, fluffy. We don't want to make it look fluffy. We want to uh, make sure that it's a it's a powerful tool. Watch out for the index. We thank you three very much indeed. Fascinating stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.